All right, so uh, so the expectations aren't set too high, right? So all, all, all I can do now is fail miserably. So that works out great. Um, you notice up here the title is you know the addiction ecosystem, right? It's not it's not it's not the opioid treatment ecosystem. It's not the benzodiazepine treatment system or alcohol. It's the addiction treatment ecosystem, because we if we build a system dedicated to a singular issue within addiction. When that goes away, then what we have is a brick and nothing that will help us for the next one or the next one or the next one. And if you look at the history of addiction, we have had an opioid and heroin crisis before. We have had a cocaine and crack cocaine crisis before. We have had an alcohol crisis before. Everybody loves that word. They like epidemic. And when this first started, it looked just like an epidemic on a map where it started in a place and then you would have a few people and then it seemed to grow and you could watch that. Now we have missed the boat and it is now endemic, meaning that it is in society and it is a natural history part of everything that we have to do on a regular basis. And we are failing at treating it because we own almost 0% of the ecosystem we need to treat it. And so what I want to do to start is to get people to understand, one, how we got here, two, what is addiction and why should us understanding the neuroscience of addiction actually drive the treatment and then three, more importantly, I will be very specific about what we can do to fix it. There is no pie in the sky. I build treatment systems for a living. I have worked in almost every aspect of healthcare that there is, both in the places that have failed and are miserable at this and places that are good at it. I've seen close to 400 treatment providers around the country and the way in which they deliver care and whether, that are, whether those are large hospital systems, single people who hung a, a shingle out and said, I'm going to treat patients and I've done street medicine in Camden, New Jersey, and seen people out in the street and met them where they are. And from all of that is where I've gotten to the point where we need to finally just buck up and build what we would call in healthcare a line of service. We need to just build the things that we need to sustain this so that we're not getting an ROI in a minute, but we're getting that in a year and five years and 10 years and 100 years later because right now we are completely failing because we have failed to look at this as just another system that we need to build to treat something that has been around as long as human history has been here. I have no disclosures, meaning I don't get anything from pharma, I don't get anything from device, I have no investments, I have nothing to hide. On the sunshine rule, it's a big fat zero. I, uh, they actually probably wouldn't ask me to do anything because I'm pretty harsh on them on a regular basis. Um, but that's important. So when I start to talk about things, it is not my opinion. There's nothing in here that's my opinion. It's based in data, science, and math, and that's it. So if there is something that you want my opinion on, I will make sure that I first give you the data and then how I interpret it. There are some things that I've interpreted the data, but there's nothing that's just free thought on this. You deserve better than that because one person's opinion is worth absolutely nothing. This is the data, science, and math of what we're going to learn about. So back in the early days, uh, in the 80s and 70s, we had this notion of uh, how people become addicted, right? So we think about, you know, the, the despondent child who is kind of sad and alone and isolated and sitting in a corner somewhere. And, and, and that's really what it was, this poor, sad soul that had nothing else to do. And so they get matched up, you know, with somebody who maybe is the wrong group of people to be in. And it's the person who's the bad influence that they kind of sneak up behind them a little bit. And they talk to him about, hey, man, I can make you feel a little better. You're going to be just fine. You're going to be fine. Just do this. All you got to do is use this drug. It's not that big of a deal. It's going to make you feel better. You're not going to hate your life anymore, man. It's great, right? So the next thing we know, we end up with somebody who is using heroin because that's what was around at that point. We weren't prescribing medications for pain unless you were at the end of life. And so this was the general pathway that somebody became addicted to heroin. Well, that whole conundrum has really changed over the last few years. And now we've managed over really the last decade to 15 years to turn what used to be a, a sacred interaction between uh, someone who trained for their entire adult life to care for someone else and do that with trust and, and knowledge and this uh, promise that we made and this oath that we took to primum non nocare to do no harm, right? This is what we said, this is we took this oath. 
I believe in this oath. I believe in it so much. It's actually tattooed on my right arm. And it's to remind me that that is the reason and the thing that we have to think about when we do it. But now we take a physician, well-meaning, well-studied. They see somebody who needs help, broke their arm. Something really basic, right? Who doesn't do that? How many kids don't break something in sports? How many kids don't you know, goof off and do something on a trampoline, which is, as an ER doctor, something I will never own? because we just call it the fracture machine in the ER. That's pretty, I don't care if you got a net on it or whatever. I don't, it's, it doesn't matter. People just get broken on that thing. And then, at that point, we write them pain meds. The thing that we think that they needed. In fact, the thing that we thought the science actually showed, right? We thought that the science showed that patients really needed these medications to feel better. And so we wrote those medications. And we then wrote them again. And then we refilled it again. And then we continued to refill it, and then we freaked out. And then we stopped writing it. And then we cut patients off. And now we're cutting back. And now what we get is the same end result of that poor despondent kid with a bad influence, and now we've turned other kids into a situation where they have gone from, I had a small injury, I was seen by a treatment provider, and now I'm using heroin on a daily and regular basis. And this ends in really only a couple of pathways. And one of those, apparently, is England. <laughs> um, <laughs> because that is the only CV of a cop I could find on the internet. So um, it's just, uh, it's a cop, OK? <laughs> if it was one of ours, they would have like an M4 with a, uh, you know, that. It would be a little different. But anyway, so you either end up arrested, right? because you're out in the wrong place at the wrong time, you're, risky, you're using risky behaviors that you would have never used in any other situation, and you get caught and you get busted, or you die. And most people do both. They end up somehow incarcerated, somehow stuck in jail, somehow in the legal system, and then we think they've learned their lesson, and then we cut them loose, and then they die. And then somebody's parent, somebody's kid, ends up dying because we didn't have a system built for them to live in, for them to get help in, for them to feel comfortable in, for them not to feel ashamed. Because for the last 70 years, that system has been built on somebody having to stand up and say, I am an addict. Instead of what we exactly saw from Gabrielle, which is, I'm a person. No other disease makes you stand up and say, your disease is who you are. No, nobody stands up and says, I am breast cancer. I am a heart attack. Nobody does that. In fact, we push very hard in every other aspect of medicine away from that. So how did we get here, right? We got here, and everybody owns their share of this. There is nobody off of the hook, right? So you look up here, poor acute and chronic pain management theory. So we started off with just bad theory. If I give a med that blocks pain in the brain, obviously that's the best way to treat pain. It's not, as we find out. In fact, long-term use of these medications, even if you remove addiction as an issue, are bad for pain. They don't even treat pain well. They increase pain to the point of what we call hyperalgesia, which is where a non-painful stimuli, me rubbing your arm or patting it like that, feels like it's on fire because the brain doesn't like to be told what to do. But then we had a big push by manufacturers who needed a new market, right? Uh-oh, palliative care is not gonna pay for my margin. So let's find another group that we can do, this chronic non-cancer pain group. So they, they then push that. We bought it, and we start writing the prescriptions, right? So we write the prescriptions. But then we have the distribution of these by these large distribution companies who were sending out as many as 9 million pills to a pharmacy in a city of only 400 people. And somehow that seemed okay to that group. And then the final, the final layer, right, the final layer of something to catch this were the pharmacists. And they just filled it. So everybody here failed. You ever, anybody seen in uh, lean processing or quality, that Swiss cheese model where you find like that just goes through? Well, imagine this. This is just all of those aligned and it's only holes. Because nobody was pushing back on this. There were a few of us that were pushing back, but we got shut down by quality officers in our hospital almost immediately. And we didn't know how to do something else. So when we look at this, you know, we have this issue of 
we need to learn how to use pain medicines when they need to be used. That's basic. CDC helped us with that. The VA DOD has helped us with that. Fine. We need to make sure that we don't swing the pendulum too far the other way. Because you know what? If you have a femur fracture, yoga is not going to help. <laughs> right? Four months later, it may help. But with the bone sticking out of your leg, if I show up, you better give me some morphine. I will be very unhappy if you're like, all right, we're going to do a mindfulness session right now. Just <laughs> deep breath, one full body scan. We're going to start up here. We'll, we'll skip this part because I'm sure that's not going to be good. I just want you to sit with that and you'll be okay. Right? So we know the basics of what not to do. But as we saw in that first slide, what happens if you do this without understanding addiction? We kill people. By stopping the flow of prescription opioids without having a net to catch those patients, we have killed people actively. This is not a passive thing. This is predictable. We've talked to all the lawmakers, the DOJ. Everybody was aware of this. We, sp we spouted this from the highest mountain that we had. And yet we took the easy route, which is, well, we could at least stop this. I agree we need to do that, right? We have to turn off the water if the house is flooding. But if somebody's drowning, let's just get them out of the water first, and then we can figure out how to stop the leak, all right? When we look at this, we have to think about this, this pathway. So this is my description of addition. This is my definition, right? It's an conglomeration because everybody defines it differently. So this is just basic, the very basic aspect of it. It's not the philosophy or the theory. It's the basic aspect. It's not the DSM-5 diagnosis. But if this is about addiction, let's talk a little bit about the neuroscience. And you should probably check out your pens and papers because there will be a quiz. And if you fail, you cannot leave. The doors are locked. So you need three things to survive, right? You need food, you need water, you need dopamine. Now, my angry little nerdy science friends who I love very much will tell me you need oxygen too. And I get that, but for the purposes of this, you also need skin and all these other things. <laughs> but we're gonna stick with food, water, and dopamine, all right? So humor me. So dopamine is this chemical in the brain that is really responsible for creating, you know, love and connection. It's, uh, it's the chemical that's first released along with oxytocin to create a mother-baby bond. It strengthens that and allows that relationship to grow. It's the only chemical that allows for a father-kid bond, right? It's the only one. We don't even get the oxytocin boost. So when we look at that, that by itself should tell us something about how important this is. It is about the human connection, but it also is the most important chemical in motivation. So for the rest of this time when we're talking, whenever I say dopamine, I want you to think motivation. And anytime I say motivation, I want you to think dopamine because they are forever linked. They are the same thing. If you don't have motivation, that also means you don't have enough dopamine. If you don't have enough dopamine, you will not have outward motivation. That is really, really important for the disease of addiction because the final common pathway for addiction is a breakdown in this part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. These parts are important because if you have a heart problem, we know where the heart is. It's in the middle. We teach people about this. It's right in here somewhere where I have to put my hand, right? It goes right there. And we ultimately teach people about it because we think it's important. But if I ask my patients, what is the part of your body most important in healing in order for us to get you stable within your disease of addiction? They'll just give me a blank stare. So they learn these. They know nucleus accumbens. They know the ventral tegmental area. They know the lateral bed nuclei of the amygdala. They know the anterior cingulate gyrus. They know the lateral anterior uh, forebrain bundle. They know the limbic system as a general piece of equipment. It is responsible for how happy or sad we are. All of those things are important to understand because they truly underlie the disease of addiction. And if we don't even know the basics, then how are we going to build a system to think about it and fix it? So when we look at this, we are built with an amount of dopamine that we are supposed to have. We actually even know how much this is, thanks to Dr. Elliot Gardner and Nora Volkow at NIDA. They actually went in with little bitty micro pipettes and the animals and figured out how much dopamine lives in that nucleus accumbens. You know, they would stimulate it and say, what does it look like at the highest when it's the super happy rat? What does it look like at the lowest with the super sad rat? And most importantly, they figured out how to correlate that on what we call a functional MRI, which is a picture of the brain that shows how it's working. So this allows us to correlate 
a density of a signal on a, on a picture with how much that part of the brain is working, which allowed us to look at this in humans. So we knew what it looked like there. Now we know what it looks like in humans. And we found out that all of us in a general setting need about 50 nanograms per deciliter to get out of bed, to get out of bed and get the cup of coffee, to be outside where it's like super amazing outside and be like, I'm gonna go sit through a lecture. That requires some dopamine. <laughs> so bravo, all of you passed the baseline dopamine test. Unless you were dragged here against your will and you're still angry in the car and you got dragged in. Then I'll have to give them extra dopamine to the person who dragged you here. <laughs> but when we look at it, it's 50, right? Uh, 40. 40 nanograms per deciliter is the day that you wake up in the morning and you pick up the phone and you call to work and you fake vomit on the phone and you say you're not coming in. That's it. I just can't come. I'm so sick. I just can't, I can't make it. Not going to happen. That's right. That's 40. That's like you have no motivation that day. You just want to stay home and do whatever you want to do when you need your mental health day, right? So you stay home, I hide in my little basement and play Xbox because it's the only way I can fully disconnect from like the uh, very tangential thought process that rotates through the brain. But, but other people do what they do. Some people take a bath, some people get a massage, some people just hide. You know, it's, it's whatever you need, right? That's 40. So what about the best day ever? Well, that's about 100 nanograms per deciliter. So, so that day when you win the lottery and you have uh, an island and you get 2% body fat all at the same time, like all of that happens and you're like, yes, this is amazing. That's, that's what we're supposed to be. That's the highest natural place that the brain is supposed to be is about 100 nanograms per deciliter. You're wicked happy, but you're not going to walk into traffic, right? It's an important maximum to have. It allows you to still think about your life and think about pros and cons of a decision you're going to make. You're not just going to start making things that don't make sense to other people. So what happens when I introduce an outside substance into that body that increases dopamine? And we'll start with the one that is the most powerful one, and that's methamphetamine. So if somebody uses methamphetamine, it increases their dopamine past that 100. In fact, it increases it tenfold and goes up to 1,100 nanograms per deciliter. And then if we add some other substances, marijuana, oh, it's addictive, about 600. And if we look at alcohol, heroin, all of those are higher than they should ever be. It is amazing that when we start tracking this, what we find is that all of the substances that create the largest amount of problems have one final common pathway. They all work a little differently in other parts of the brain and other little pieces of it. Some work on a GABA system, a glutamate system, sympathomimetic, blah, blah, blah. None of that really matters at the end of the day because the focus of all of this is on what is the final common pathway? And this is for gambling. This is for glucose-based overeating. It's the same final common pathway, right? And that is, have I taken something that has made my dopamine go way past where it should? Because my body does not like that. In fact, it doesn't like it so much that after that first time that you've used methamphetamine or used heroin or drink alcohol if you're genetically predisposed and all of these things happen, it will never make that dopamine again. It will never make that same amount again, ever. It will clamp down the amount of dopamine released from those neurons. And that is what we call, not clinically, but pragmatically chasing the dragon. This is what my patients tell me is the early part of addiction. The part where you still can possibly make a decision the way that we think about it, but every time that you use, you lose a piece of that logic model. You lose a piece of that comprehensive decision making because the body is driving towards that dopamine, but it's fighting back as well. So it fights back first by decreasing the amount of dopamine released. If you keep using a substance, it actually decreases the amount produced. And then if you continue to use, it actually shrinks the neurons so they can't produce a lot of dopamine. And then if you've used for an extensive amount of time, we have good data to show that it actually kills those neurons and you may never be able to produce a normal amount of dopamine again. So what does that look like in a patient clinically who's been using heroin? So if a patient uses heroin, the first time they use it, they get that biggest bump of dopamine, body locks it down. You go from 900 to 700 to 500 to 200 to 100, and then you cross this threshold where no matter how much heroin you use, you can't even get to the best natural day of your life because your body has decreased the production of dopamine so much. 
And then by the time that you've been doing this for nine months to 15 months, at this point, you use for two reasons. You don't want to withdraw, and you only want to feel normal. Because when you use heroin at this point, your dopamine goes to 50. Without it, it goes to 10. And when you get dopamine down to 10 or 20 nanograms per deciliter, you don't have what? Motivation. When you tell somebody to pull up by the bootstraps, what is required? Huh, interesting. So we, are, we should, let's put that into clinical terms. You tell your freaking nucleus accumbens, it better start producing dopamine. Because that's what we're saying when we're telling them they just need to start doing better things or, or doing the right thing or thinking. We are asking them to create out of thin air dopamine. And we do that even in a lot of the treatment modalities of, of the yesteryear. And sadly enough, even currently, we take a patient, let's say we did everything right. We get this patient, we identify him. Let's say that everybody screens. How, what percent of primary care routinely screens for addiction? Less than 10%. What percent of OBGYNs routinely screen for addiction? Less than 10%. Well, we're gonna have a hard time finding stuff if we don't look for it, right? But let's say they all did it. Let's say magically we all screened on a regular basis. So we all screen on a regular basis, we find our patients and you're like, we got you. We got you, man, we're gonna take care of you. You're all good. So what I'm gonna do for you is I'm gonna go put you in a room and I'm gonna let you hang out there while your dopamine's sitting around the toilet level. And then I'm gonna tell you, you should come to group. And then you have to make sure and talk to me during group because if you don't, I'm gonna think you just don't wanna get better. And then if they, if they fail, meaning they leave because their brain is screaming so loud for dopamine. And remember I talked about you know, food and water, right? Well, in a few minutes, I'm gonna tell you how the screaming for dopamine looks like in craving on a functional MRI compared to food and water, starvation and dehydration. But we need to understand all of these parts of the brain. If you're writing policy about this, if you're writing regulation about this, if you are a payer, if you are a provider, for sure, you should know every single one of these pieces of the brain and what they do. You should know that we're building a system so that it improves the outcome of patients who have a chronic brain disorder that we call addiction. And the final common pathway is the nucleus accumbens in the ventral tegmental area. That's it. It's a pretty straightforward disease. And as a neuroscientist, I, this is an amazing disease because you can watch a trajectory, you can predict it. You can predict exactly what's gonna happen with continued use because we know when you perturb these areas of the brain, people will have very predictable behaviors, which is why we define addiction based on behavior. We don't define addiction based on the presence or absence of a drug in a urine. You can come into the emergency department and I see you and you have alcohol and cocaine and marijuana and tobacco in your urine. That doesn't define addiction. It's a risk factor, but you might've just had a really crazy Friday night. <laughs> you know, we've all seen the movies. But when we look at this, if we know that lack of dopamine is the, is the major issue, and the body is craving dopamine, when you crave dopamine, you get into survival mode, just like you would do if you're starving or dehydrated, right? And then if you're in survival mode, you will have a primal action, and that may be an altercation. That may be you think to yourself, maybe it's safer if I steal this T-shirt so that I can sell it, and so that I can go get dopamine. This is the, the stuff that happens, but let's dig into craving. Craving is important, so let's think about that one for a sec. It's a little bit of a nebulous concept, right? Well, luckily, we now know what parts of the brain are responsible for craving, even the different types of craving. But ultimately, when we look at those, brain, those things on functional MRI, we, we started to look at it and be like, all right, well, how does this compare to other states that we know craving seems to be probably a really natural process? So, we looked at, you know, we already went through that, boom. So if we look at craving and we start to think about what it is, um, we took a group of patients, and when I say we, it's the collective nerdy we. So I have friends that are even nerdier than I am who do this research for a living. at Carrion at Northwestern and Gardner and these guys at NIH. Uh, they're like creepy nerdy, it's awesome. I mean, it's like so much fun to hang out with. 
But what, we, what they did is they took a group of patients and they said, you're not going to get any fluid for three days. So not IV, not oral, nothing. It got to the point where they became moderately dehydrated. In fact, their IRB was like, this is not, I'm not okay with this at this point. <laughs> but we agreed to it on paper, um, so let's just finish the study. And, um, and so what they did is they put them in an MRI machine. They, they had to keep them on the stretcher because when they stood up, their heart rates would go up and blood pressure would drop. They were that dehydrated. And uh, so they put them in an MRI machine, and then they started playing sounds of water. They started talking to them about waterfalls. They, started, they took water and they sprinkled it on their feet. You know, they made them taste water, but they couldn't swallow anything. And, and then they made them describe water. And they functionally MRI'd their brain. Right? So what they found is in the areas that we know of craving, they had something about the relative size of a baseball. Right? Then we did it for food. Food was great. So you tell us at the beginning of the study, people told them their favorite food. And then they didn't eat for five days. So no food for five days. They got IV fluids and vitamins, but only enough for maintenance. Not anything that would go up. So they went five days with no food, and then they put them into the functional MRI. They brought in their favorite food. They wafted it into the MRI tube, <laughs> took pictures of their brain, right? They made them describe their favorite food, taste it and spit it out. They had one person, they almost didn't get this. He like literally was like, I am eating this food. <laughs> um, uh, but it was funny. They kept him in the study, but it was like, uh, you know, but it was that strong, right? Well, when we look at that functional MRI and we look at the relative size of craving in those areas we talked about, it's about the relative size of a basketball. So starvation is a little above dehydration. But I want you to think about this basic scenario. I'm walking across the desert for three days. I get to the other side of this desert. I haven't had any fluid for three days. I'm super hot. I think I'm going to die. My brain is screaming for water. It knows I'm dehydrated. It measures the salinity or salt content of my brain. And it's like, this is going to kill you soon. You need to get water because we've all been a little dehydrated, right? And we're like, we'll get up at three o'clock in the morning when it's like freezing cold in the house to go get a glass of water because something in the body says, I gotta go get that. And that seems crazy. I lived in Michigan for 10 years. You guys live in Colorado. That's just like crazy in the winter to get up and do that, but we'll do it. But think about this. When I'm walking across the desert three days and I'm there, right? I get there, beautiful glass of water. Condensation coming down the sides, a couple of ice cubes. I'm remembering that like Sprite commercial with the, uh, uh, you know, back in the seven up, I guess, back in the day. And I see that I'm gonna go to grab it. Guy steps in front of me and says, no, 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 that's my water. I'm like, all right, stab. And then I move them out of the way. <laughs> and then I take the water and I drink it. And then people like, people be like, well, oh, this guy, the dude should have got stabbed. He like stood in front of the water. That guy was gonna die. That made no sense. You know, and you kind of get on the side of me because you're like, that makes sense. He was gonna die of dehydration. And in the same for starvation, people do crazy stuff. We've seen these videos, um, you know, when there's been famine and this, and people will steal from their neighbor, and people will, you know, when you're starving, you'll cut people up and eat them. I mean, there's like, people have done crazy stuff when they're starving, and if you're not starving, it seems completely outlandish, unless you're like Hannibal Lecter, I guess. But at the end, when we look at it, it doesn't make sense unless you're in that situation. So if we look at the craving and the functional MRI for addiction, what they looked at uh, as they took alcohol and opioid use disorder patients uh, that had been off of those, Medica off of those two uh, drugs for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. They did it at 180, one year, year and a half, and two years. So they just looked at it. And what they did is they put them in the functional MRI, and they said, what, tell me about the first time you used, tell me about the last time you used, and describe the use to me. And when they looked at all of those, and I'm only going to talk about 30 days, and two years, because from 30 days to hunt to the uh, year and a half mark, there was no difference. In fact, there was a period of time in which craving went up. Even 90 and 120 days later, craving was at its maximum as compared to here. And so when that happened, the functional MRI that they did on these patients had a relative size of a baseball field. And so when we start to look at what people will do when they don't have access to water or if they're starving, and then we put it into, what if you don't have dopamine? What if we've taken away the thing that your brain sees as the primal base of survival, the ability to motivate, the ability to get out of bed and go get food, 
the ability to, to love and belong and connect, and you have that level of craving, and then we still expect this person to sit in group with no dopamine and their brain pinging off like this. This starts to not collectively make a lot of sense for me. And so if we start to look at this, if we're low on dopamine, wouldn't it make sense to replace dopamine? We do it for serotonin. When people are depressed, we give them serotonin, right? This is not a bit, if people are low on insulin, we give them insulin. Not really a discussion about it. People are low on dopamine. Now we've tried to give them dopamine and it doesn't work because by the time you get to the amount of this very old brain, the very old, very isolated part of the brain responsible for this, they start having all kinds of movement disorders and other things like that. So you can't just give them dopamine like Cinemet, like you would give a Parkinson's patient because the doses it takes is 10 times what it takes for Parkinson. But if we start to look at this, what we do have are two medications for opioid use disorder that very safely and consistently create a situation in which we have stabilized dopamine. If we have a patient who is in the emergency department, and I saw one last week, they come in, they're in floored withdrawal because we just saved their life with the naloxone. It's awesome, right? This person's alive. Pre this whole crisis, before I got training in addiction, because I was no different than any other ER doctor, except I hated my job a lot more, which is why I went into other things. But when I was there, if I saw that patient back in 2007, 2006, I would see them and I'd be like, that was a stupid decision. You almost died. I mean, God, come on, man. Think about it. Here's some clonidine. Go home. Here's a piece of paper with some phone numbers on it. You'd be surprised, but that's kind of the tone. If anybody's been in and around mainstream medicine, um, that's kind of the tone and it hasn't changed. So I left emergency medicine, went and got trained in addiction, felt a lot of shame for a while about how I treated those patients, and, uh, and then got trained in pain, and, uh, and I've kind of gone full circle. I mean, my last two years, I've basically, I've worked for a nonprofit in Camden and did street medicine for a little while while I was doing a fellowship, and, and then I went back to the emergency department about eight months ago. Fully trained in pain and addiction, I've done interventions and all of this stuff, and I walk in, uh, and I'm a locums guy, right? So I just work at random hospitals. I fill in a, you know, fill a slot and I just work some shifts and then I'll do that at another hospital. So I don't have any ties to these places. I don't live in the community. I don't know the medical staff. And I walk in and the first shift I'm working at one of these hospitals, I hear them talking to the patients the way I used to talk to the patients and I got so angry. But I'm like, I probably shouldn't lose the job that I just finished like seven mountains worth of paperwork to get because it takes that much to work in a hospital. And and ultimately what happened was the next shift, which was the next day, I saw a patient that came in in withdrawal. I called the pharmacy, said, I would like eight milligrams of buprenorphine, please. And they're like, what? Who are you? I'm a doctor in the emergency department. Um, I'll have to look and see if we have that, uh, please. And they do, because I've learned that you kill, um, you don't really kill flies with honey. You just catch them and then slowly massage them to death um, while they're stuck. And so you continue to do that. Uh, and they were like, well, we have this. That would be wonderful if you could send that down. I'm, I'm sure my patient would be very happy with that. They send it down. I walk over to the patient and I'm like, I, I, I'm Dr. Waller. Um, I'm also an addiction medicine doctor. I'm happy to treat you and see you. And I'm so sorry that you're in this situation. It must be very scary for you. And uh, I have a medication that I can give you uh, that will turn off your addiction literally in about 30 seconds. And that's not an overstatement. I give them the medication 30 seconds later their overt withdrawal from the naloxone I gave them is gone. They're having a conversation with me. And I say, would you like some help? Would you like to get some help with this? We have plenty of ways we can do it. And they said, yes. I wrote them a prescription for buprenorphine. And I called um, the provider uh, that I found on the SAMHSA website, uh, who's in the location, said, are you taking new patients? He said, yes. I go, when can you see him? He said, eight days. I wrote a prescription for eight days for the lowest dose that will keep them out of withdrawal, and then I got them to follow up in eight days. Is that rocket science? I mean, did I have to build like the Mars rover for that? I called for a medication. I gave a patient a medication for a very well-known and understood withdrawal syndrome. I asked them if they would like treatment for their disease that has a very high mortality rate, and they said yes, and I treated them. Why isn't that happening everywhere? Well, let's talk about that. So as we go through, Imagine this is cardiology. You walk out of your two bedroom flat that you're paying 5,000 a month for in New York. 
and you turn right, and there's an outpatient provider. There you turn left. There's a guy who specializes in left ventricular failure. You turn right. There's a guy who specializes in right ventricular failure. And his close cousin, that's right ventricular electrical issues. That electrocardiologist, you know, electrophysiologist is going to take care of that. Oh, and then the other guy that says, I'm better with the bundle branch, so I'm going to take care of that one. And you just refer back and forth. And oh, by the way, I put this thing called a ventricular assist device, which literally we surgically implant on the heart, and it beats the heart for you. And it has a little battery pack. You can go home with these things, right? Or you go in and get a heart cath, or you can go, you can go in, you can transplant. Sure, I'll give you a new one. We'll just pull out the old one, pop a new one in there, you'll be fine. I mean, you can get all of those things. Or you can have somebody tell you, you know, it's not your heart, it's panic attacks, and we need to work on that too. But you're still going to go through a cardiologist somewhere along the way, right? Somebody's going to do an EKG, somebody's going to read that. And we have that entire ecosystem built. So this is cardiology. No matter what hospital you go to in the country, somebody's got a plan if you show up with a heart attack. I don't care how remote you are. If you show up as in, in that emergency department and you are having a heart attack, and I don't have anything but me in that hospital, Right? I've worked in Iron, up in Iron Mountain, Michigan, right? Upper Peninsula. That is, about the, that is, I think, the most remote place in the country on the continental U.S. And I went up there, and I'm working a shift in this little hospital. It had oxygen coming out of the wall, so I guess we called it a hospital. And, and, and I saw this patient. He's having a heart attack, and I'm like, what do you guys do for STEMIs? Do you have, like, uh, clot-busting medication, which is a thing you can give? They're like, no, 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 we just fly them out. I'm like, all right. So I called. I ordered a helicopter. Helicopter came, picked up the dude, flew him where he could get a heart cath, got a heart cath. He had a needle in his groin. After, from the time I saw him to the time he landed at his definitive treatment in the main portion of, of Michigan at, uh, in Munson and had a needle in his groin, 96 minutes. All right, that's a pretty well-oiled machine. All right, so that's cardiology. This is addiction. <laughs> and this is probably generous. What we have are a few things where we corral a whole lot of people in and we shove them in there and we do have them do a lot of stuff for themselves while they're there. There's really not a, stuff, a lot of stuff done for them at most places. Uh, some are really good, but I've been to a lot of them and most are mediocre to poor, um, mainly because it's terribly funded if you take uh, public funding for this treatment. Um, and if it's uh, highly funded, you probably don't need it, by the way, because um, you still produce natural dopamine. But then after you've been there, they set you loose to go find your next treatment. And if the sheep are, you know, the sheep will do their best, right? They'll huddle together for safety. So that's like self-help, right? They're all going to hang out. They're going to have the support from their friends so the wolves don't kill them. Some will wander off to go look for the next thing that they want to do, and then they're going to get killed by the wolf, right? They're going to die. But sooner or later, no matter what happens, every single one of these sheep gets sheared. And that is exactly what it is like to have addiction in the United States. Nobody knows what anybody else is doing, Nobody knows what this sheep over here is doing or that sheep over there is doing. Nobody, you know, and even in the pen, they're like, what'd you just do? I don't know. We're just talking about stuff. <laughs> I mean, I've gone to these places and I've sat there. And I'm like, well, what kind of stuff are you talking about? They're like, you know, you know, like, I don't know. You know why they don't know? Because you also require appropriate amounts of dopamine to onboard emotional memory. What is your favorite memory, like the longest term? It's like the happiest time and the scariest time, right? Those are the two memories that stick there no matter what happens. Right, one you get PTSD from, and one you're like, oh, that's great, I remember that. All of those were big dopamine moments. All of those were when your body dumped out dopamine, and you locked in that memory. So good learning means that you get a lot more dopamine. Bad learning is where you don't, and you forget it. Just, you know, you read a book that's super boring, and you don't remember a thing about it four minutes later, right? And, or we've all had that, you know, Calculus three professor who, you know, you couldn't understand every third word, and you're just like, I don't remember anything. I'm going to have to go to the library for another six hours to figure this out. So, so we've all gone through that. But if you don't have dopamine in your brain, you can't get any of this. So to take a person who has an opioid use disorder and shove them in an inpatient setting, which, by the way, at one year, the outcomes look exactly the same for outpatient and inpatient. So we don't necessarily need more, be we need more beds because we only have 15% of total capacity. So we need to grow the entire field of addiction medicine by 85 to 90% to actually meet the need. So yes, we need more beds. We just don't need more beds specifically for opioid use disorder. We need IOP and partial hospitalization. I mean, these are all the things that we need, and we know exactly what we need. So when we look through, this is an addiction treatment system. Now, you could replace this for cardiology or endocrinology or cancer or any other ology you want to talk about. It fits into this. You have levels of care 
Up here, I talk about level one, level two, level three, and level four. Those are well-defined treatment levels of care and addiction. One being outpatient treatment, two being intensive outpatient treatment, three being residential, and four being medically managed detox. There are some levels in between there, and there's 0.5, which we call self-help, but also is where I would put prevention. And then when we start to look at that, it's well-defined. But every other aspect of medicine has screening and referral, data collection and evaluation, social determinants and prevention, at least talked about, clinical structures that work and are standardized and people can predict, and then payment models that support those things, right? And we actually have treatment education for what to do when somebody comes into the hospital and you have to push on their chest a lot and you give them a lot of chemicals and you send them up to a cath lab. Every hospital I work at, I have to watch at least an hour or two of their video for a STEMI. I'm a board certified emergency medicine doctor. I've seen hundreds of STEMIs in my life, a ST elevation MI, a heart attack. I've seen those, I could do this in my sleep. You know exactly what they get, right? You get them there, you give them an aspirin, you make them chew it, it's 324, it tastes terrible. You just tell them that, you know what's gonna happen. You give them 5,000 units of bolus heparin, then you start them on a drip at 12 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per minute. You get that started, you call your cardiologist. They yell at you for a few minutes about wanting to admit a patient to get it a heart catheterization, but then they're like, okay, fine, we'll call the lab in. And then they go do that. You read the lab, you talk to the patient, you talk to the family, you give them a little bolus of a beta blocker if the cardiologist wants you to, you know, or you give them bevcixumab, which is another medication that busts the, you know, bust the clot, and you sit in the cath lab. You finish your paperwork, you move on to the next patient with diarrhea. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's an ER doctor's life, right? That's just, that's just what we do. And, but every, along that entire path, I know if a patient comes in with chest pain, do they just need to go follow up with their primary doc? Do they just need to come in, we rule them out with some chemicals and look at them? Do I need to put them in the cath lab or do I need to admit them to the ICU? Those are levels of care in cardiology. We know that every hospital I go to, again, those are all defined. We have good guidelines for all of those things. If I don't give that aspirin, I have a nurse the next morning waking me up after my night shift, chewing me out because I didn't give the aspirin. She's, she's like, uh, Dr. Waller, I know you're new here. <laughs> Um, and, you know, but I just wanted to call to your attention that you forgot to give um, an aspirin to this patient. And I'm like, I'm barely awake. And I'm like, um, yeah, maybe I don't, I think I pretty much, I, I think I clicked the order on the electronic medical record du jour and it should have happened. And she's like, well, it, you know, just, it didn't. That should happen in addiction medicine, right? Somebody should call me after a night shift in addiction medicine and be like, you saw two patients and you started them on the wrong medication or you failed to put them on a medication. Can you explain to me your logic for not offering them those pathways of treatment? Nobody sees what happens when we close the door for therapy. You know, how much oversight uh, do we have when somebody's doing cognitive behavioral therapy? You know, in addiction treatment. The door closes, the patient comes out. What'd you do? I don't know, we chatted. Was it good? No, maybe, I don't know. I mean, if it's not structured, that's what it is. And we call it eclectic therapy, which means I rented a friend for um, 50 minutes and then they charged an FTE, you know, something for that. So this is, these are all, this is what the data shows. I mean, the data is very simple. Unless you have somebody trained in cognitive behavioral therapy and unless you have somebody trained in addiction medicine or trained to deliver basic addiction medicine, then we don't know what we're getting. We have to build this entire system. It doesn't exist. None of these things exist. So as we start to look at how we're gonna do that, we have this basic concept of how we need to do it, right? So the basic concept is we start off with, we have to build the capacity. We have to make sure and figure out how we're gonna have enough capacity at all the levels of care. Now, every community is different. How do you figure out what to do? Well, crazy enough, addiction medicine actually has a patient identification and placement tool that's been around for, oh, I don't know, 30 years. It's been around for 30 years and it's now nationally recognized, fully understood. It was originally the patient, patient, uh, patient placement criteria. Now it's the ACM criteria. We also have an online version of it called Continuum, which means that you can go to a website, you can do a questionnaire for a patient, it tells you exactly what level of care they need. The person who does that questionnaire can be a medical assistant. They just have to be trained in how to click the buttons right. Because all you do is read the question. You don't have to make it up, it's not a gut feeling, it's not a hope. We have the science to match them with the right levels of care. The other cool thing about this is once you've done a thousand patients, you'll know exactly what levels of care you need to build in your, in your area. Because if 50% of them come up as a level two, but all you have are inpatient beds, you need to build up all these IOPs. In LA, they did a couple of hundred thousand patients with this and they found that they needed level 3.2, which is what we call partial hospitalization. 
what they found there is in LA County, 11 million people, right? The GDP of almost every other state in this county, they don't have a one level 3.2 provider. What do they have now? Six, because they knew that that's what they needed to build. They didn't just throw money at it and burn it, which is what's happened with a lot of the money that's come out because what they do is just enhance the things that they have because it's easier to add on to what you have rather than build new. And so this money needed to be spent quickly. It was handed down, all well-intentioned, but still ultimately built out what they already have even bigger. And so now what we end up is a lopsided system. And it's the equivalent of showing up to the, uh, uh, the emergency department with chest pain. And whether you're 22 with a panic attack or you're just worried, you still go to the cath lab. We're not gonna worry about this. You're going to get a heart cath. We'll figure out the panic stuff later. And that's exactly the same thing that's happening here is everybody gets like the either either the biggest or the least because we haven't built out the treatment system. So if we look at, you know, what we have to do for capacity, it's just this basic stuff. We should know how many beds we have available in a community. We should know how many appointments are available in a week. My hospital that I worked at where I ran an integrated clinic knew how many appointments I had available in 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, two weeks from now, when my next first available appointment was, how many appointments of mine were set up to be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, uh, who, who it was, how many no-shows that patient had had. I mean, the science of business and healthcare right now is kind of at its peak. In fact, we've gotten to the point where we've lean processed happiness right out of healthcare, you know, where there's not room to do anything else. But we need to start doing that in addiction because nobody knows any of those answers to those questions. And so the definite transitions between the level of care, because when somebody leaves an inpatient, they need to be able to be directly connected to that next level of care. Otherwise, that's like somebody going from the ICU straight to home. You're like, all right, you figured it out. You know, do not pass go, do not collect $200. You can pay $200, but don't collect $200. So what about competency? This is the biggest one for me. Um, I mean, I spend most of my career now educating, um, whether that be really deep dive utilization of treatment of addiction or pain or that, but competency is huge. And this is a massive lapse in, in addiction because you can have someone who has been an addiction treatment provider for 20 years and not know crap about how to treat addiction. I mean, of all the ones that I've seen, it is atrocious. It is scary. And we, we have just now, got, we now have two American Board of Medical Specialties, but the problem is, is this is not a doctor problem to fix. Doctors need to be a portion of it, but they can't be the whole fix. This is a team sport and addiction, more so than really any, anything else. Behavioral health is, is uh, definitely the same way. And so that means you need uh, therapy providers, but that's not somebody who took a little online course and now I'm a certified blah, 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 and now I'm gonna actually go do therapy for a patient because wrong therapy is wrong drug it actually causes worse outcomes for patients. When we start looking at consistency, now this is you know, the big one. How do we know that if I put widget A here, it's always gonna get widget B added to it? We know that for cardiology, it's a well-oiled machine. If you're in an OR, has anybody ever uh, you know, witnessed an operation in any way, shape, or form? Not like the little thing that buzzes when you stick a, a deal in it, but an actual like operation, right? If you've witnessed it, I mean, it is regimented. People have their things. It's like a cockpit. You have your checkoffs, you walk through it, you know exactly what you're gonna do. And I can walk into any hospital and it's gonna be basically the same. When I was doing interventions and doing like spinal injections, um, if I went into a, uh, an outpatient surgery uh, place where I needed to get it, didn't matter who was there, if I'd never worked with them, it was regimented. We had the same thing so that I stick the right person in the right place at the right time with the right drug, right? That does not happen in any capacity whatsoever in addiction. We can't even decide on what we want to call quality. Compensation. Uh, 2008, the feds passed uh, um, MAPIA, uh, which basically said that uh, we should be paying the same, not more or any different, just the same for addiction and behavioral health as we do for any other healthcare conundrum. It didn't even get regulated, meaning they didn't finish the regulations until two years ago. So it was stalled for a while, and now we finally have it, and now it has to be enforced, because how many people know how hard it is to get addiction treatment? I know how hard, I provide it, it's hard. I even know exactly what to do when there are barriers put in front of me every day for my patients. EMR, Affordable Care Act, when that passed, Billions of dollars went to expand electronic medical records in the mainstream healthcare system. 
Not a drop of that fell to uh, behavioral health or SUD. None of it. So now what we have are people that live in this whole area with all of that. These, there are things to do. I'm not going to dig into each of these, but I want you to know that th this is not a guess anymore. We know exactly what the problems are. We know what the solutions are. There are very basic things that can be added. This is not adding an entire, it's not like I need quadrillion dollars. All I need you to do is have the pharmacy know that this medicine exists and put it in the machine. That's it. That's all I'm asking. You know, I need to be able to train people. I need people to screen because if you, can't, if you don't look for a disease, you're not going to find it. Primary care has got their issues too, right? But there are fixes. I mean, these are known things. These are, these are just known things to do. It's, it's, again, it's not a guess. This is basic math. This is just turning it into a line of service. An inpatient. This one is what drives me insane, because I, I did inpatient evaluations and treatment for both addiction and pain, and I've worked in the emergency department, so I really worked it all the way through. Um, there are easy order sets, it's click and go, that decrease the risk of poor utilization of opioids postoperatively. There are order sets you can place so that you can do a screening and evaluation and start a patient on buprenorphine. But what portion of people that are admitted to the hospital for pancreatitis or something else are started on a medication for the treatment of addiction, whether it be alcohol use disorder or opioid use disorder? Who knows? Nobody measures it. It's probably zero, though, because I've worked in a lot of hospitals, and I've been in a lot of hospitals. So we know that there are things that we can do. Government. I'm the chair of the Legislative Advocacy Committee for the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And in that capacity, um, in the last uh, three years, I've been buried. I've worked every day on something. We passed CARA. We passed Cures. Um, we're advocating now. There are 60 bills being marked up in the, uh, um, in the House. Uh, the Senate Help Committee has marked up a set of bills. It looks like we're going to have some movement in a lot of different areas, but it's sausage-making, man. I mean, it is making sausage, and so we'll know what it looks like when it's done. Um, I mean, it's a contact sport in D.C., and that's fine. There are a lot of different people who want to get things done, and that's, that's what it is. Uh, we got to fix payment. Um, and when I mean payment, also delays. You know, the delays in prior authorization have killed a lot of people. Why are, why are you making me wait three days and fill out four pieces of paper for an FDA-approved first-line medication that's available at every pharmacy in the country? I mean, that's ridiculous. That's malpractice. It's unethical. Uh, licensing. Why are you making a primary care doctor who just wants to treat their own patients with, bu with uh, buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, why are we making them fill out new licenses in states? Those aren't the people you need to be following. You know, the people who have vo large volumes of these controlled substances, that's who you need to license and follow. Um, don't waste time with the poor primary care docs because they don't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole because they don't want, you know, big bulky dudes with blue jackets with yellow letters walking in their office and scaring off grandma who's getting treated for her diabetes because they saw four patients that they put on buprenorphine. It's crazy. Uh, the not in my backyard stuff drives me insane. This happens everywhere. I mean, it happens, it happens everywhere. There are things, however, that we can do. Government can fix pretty much all of these things. And I'm going to show you when I push the right button. Or we'll just leave it there and then you have to guess. So basic things. Build out bundle payment strategies. Addiction is perfect for that. We do a whole bunch of stuff coupled at one time and then do a different bunch of stuff at a different time. Perfect for that. Temporary enhanced funding for screening and treatment. If you're a payer, the best thing you can do to get somebody to do something new is pay them for it. It has to be time limited. But if you bump it up to five times what you pay for screening, you know what? Everybody's going to be screening. And once they're just doing it as a part of their normal day, then you don't pay for screening anymore. Then you slide over and now you pay for treatment. You just, you just have to roll this through. That's just the reality. Licensing. Update the regs to match the evidence. I mean, these things, when I read these state-based regs, when they're talking about opioid treatment programs and they're overlaying federal regulations and all this, it is hysterically sad. It's like, like you want to laugh, but then you cry, and then you laugh a little more, and then you cry, and then you want to crumple it up and burn it. It's like really frustrating because it doesn't match any evidence. Most of them are 30 years old and haven't been updated since. Um, leave the small players alone. Uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard. If somebody wants to build a treatment facility that's going to live up to the expectations of the community and is fully licensed, they should get tax abated. You should give them basically no property tax for the time it takes to capitalize the system and build it and go there. Instead, we have fights for months over who can't build an addiction treatment because it's within six miles of a school and there might be a patient with addiction there. Despite the, the fact that 20% of every student, of all these students, have a parent with addiction in, in the house that could be treated at this place um, so that they can actually get them to school on time and they're not missing it. I, I don't know. City councils need to start taking the heat or the, or the state government 
and they just need to put out some regulations to basically push past the crybabies. That is the only way we're going to get past the stigma is to normalize the disease of addiction, no different than hypertension. Somebody's got to take the heat, and I have not seen a lot of champions. I've seen a lot of people who are not willing to be champions, and they're super sad, um, and they'll own that later in life. Anti-stigma campaign, pay for that. Get it out there. Figure out a way to do it. And if I see a fried egg in a pan, I will throat punch you. <laughs> I swear. I will, I will find you, and, and I will cause a lot of trouble. So, so here we are at the end, finally, in the warm room at 8.30 at night. Well, for me, it's actually 10.40, so I, you know, I don't need to go. But let's stop treading water and actually start to swim. We have been a bunch of decision cripples for a long time. We talk about wanting to do stuff. We talk about how we can do it. And we're like, well, you know what I think? I'm like, I don't care. We have data science and math. It doesn't really matter what you think. We just need to implement the known data science and math. I don't need the next biggest cool cure that's still not going to hit anybody for 25 years. I need to implement the stuff that we know now. And implementation and optimization is the wheelhouse of mainstream medicine. Mainstream medicine should own this. This is the next largest market, period. You, this is the largest market of any known disease. Other than apparently people with stigma who we can't cure. But <laughs> this is that you should be begging for these patients and optimizing the situation for them because they are going to give you the highest margin treatment of everything because they get better and they get better fast when they get evidence-based treatment. I mean, people who have an opioid use disorder, which, by the way, is the easiest addiction to treat. If I give them a medication to stabilize their dopamine, three days later, they no longer meet the criteria for addiction, those behavioral conundrums that we talk about, because their dopamine is stabilized. We can have a conversation, and they're able to onboard therapy. And they're not a captured population. They can go home with their family and maybe not lose their job because they needed 30 days away. Don't be your own worst enemy, man. Don't overthink this. People put laws in there that are crazy. I mean, in West Virginia, they post felonies right next to your PDMP. I mean, I don't know how you further stigmatize a patient. That's just ridiculous and unethical and sad. Um, and it just is mean. We've actually hit a point to where it's gone to discrimination. It's not stigma. We are fully actively discriminating against people who have a diagnosis of a disease that is treatable. Yeah. And it's disgusting. Yeah. And for everybody in the healthcare field, we're all about to get sued. I'm, I'm a part of two big lawsuits right now um, on large scale pharma type stuff. Um, and they're going to pay. And then doctors are next. And what's going to get sued are going to be the large medical groups um, that have failed to treat these patients, the large emergency medicine groups that have failed to intervene. These are ripe for class action lawsuits. Healthcare systems that cross state lines, you're going to get crushed. I'm just telling you, there are a mountain of lawyers putting these cases together, and there's 150 lawyers on each case. And there is momentum. As soon as the manufacturers go down, as soon as the distributors go down, hospitals are next, doctors are next, pharmacies are next, everybody's going to have to pay back their skin that was in the game. And you know what? We deserve it. We should, you know how much it's going to cost to fix this problem? About $3 trillion. That's been calculated you know, by the OMB. In order to build the entire treatment system responsible for the treatment of those and all of the fodder that we created from the opioid use disorder, all the kids who are now in foster care, all the people that are in jail with two felonies because of drug-related crimes that could have been prevented that now can't get a job that we have to you know, pay for through food stamps and other modalities, the people we have to get free housing because they, have the, they can't make dopamine anymore. All of those little pieces that are connected, that's a $3 trillion problem that we could have solved with a few billion. So it's coming, so you better get on this because otherwise you're gonna be the one held out to dry. And the fact that we can actually fix it is the thing that makes me most angry. We know exactly what it is. We know exactly what to do next. We know exactly how to use money where it gives you a seven to 12 uh, to one ROI. And to not do it at this point is criminal. It really does reach that, that level because people are dying and we know how to fix it and we have decided not to. So my challenge to you is to work with these brilliant people that you have working in this place that are really trying to put together all of this stuff and you build this ecosystem. You build it so that when opioids are done, it can handle the next one, whether that be benzos or marijuana 
or alcohol or some other moon-based you know, thing that people are going to get addicted to. Addiction is a human condition. It will always be there. What we can do is identify and stabilize it so it affects the fewest number of people possible. So that would be my, my ask of you. And I won't ask any more because I've gone over time. And thank you so much for this. I appreciate it. <laughs>